<laughs> On the first night of these trips, after we've left the last paddock behind, crossed the line where the clearing gang stopped and the rabbit fence stood for a while, after we've left behind towns and roads and stop signs and lights and set up camp in the yonder by an old salmon gum, my volunteer field assistant looks around at the woodland, trees stretching, leaning, fallen, decaying, bushes with intricate sclerophyllous leaves and tiny vase-shaped flowers, orange-red dust held solid by biological crusts that tell the stories of life's early branchings. She looks around and asks me, where are we? As if we hadn't spent all afternoon navigating bush tracks with maps and satellites. As if she didn't have our coordinates, latitude and longitude recorded to five decimal places in the GPS in her pocket. As if the orange-red dust hadn't already crept into our pores, painted our fingernails as we unrolled our swags, dug the fire pit, branded us younger. But I know what she means. These days, it's hard to know where you are when you've travelled for hours on a nameless, unmapped track where we are small and the land is large, and the natural forces larger still. So I tell her, well, we're, we're east of Karoon, and we're west of Geordie, and we're south of the breakaway, somewhere. But in truth, we're just here, in the natural clearing by the old salmon gum that has stood here for hundreds of years. We sleep. And the next day, we walk. We walk through the woodlands and shrublands that once extended to the edge of the continent. We walk through the traditional lands of the Wangatha, Kalamaya Kapoon, the Naju, perhaps some other cultures that have been lost along the way. Whatever happened to the Malpa, the Nyaki Nyaki? We read the stories of this land where the Mali fowl walked on soft mud after the last rain, the emu corroboree, prints parading in circles studded with sandalwood scats. There are dingo cubs and echidnas, kangaroos fighting, and fungi that lift heavy chunks of earth skywards as they rise from below. We follow trails of caterpillars that walk in lines of hundreds, nose to tail, nose to tail, nose to tail, from tree to tree and across landscapes. The fox that walked here a month ago still witnessed in the clay. Sand plains sun-kissed as far as the eagle can see, my spirit can soar. Algas bear witness. Golden orb spiders spin their golden thread. There are pig scats and camel prints, rabbit warrens, cat pads, and courting donkeys caught on camera. <laughs> yes, it's all a bit different now. We're all creatures in strange lands in some ways. And yet, this land still holds ancient stories, a Gondwanan lineage, and between toxic waste dumps and giant holes in the ground, more eucalypts, flowers and arthropods than I can ever hope to know all of. A wildness I can feel. I ask the land questions about what we're doing out here with these precious metals. And what do all of these lines that crisscross the landscape mean? By the time we reach Bungalbin, we've already forgotten what a hill looks like, 
arrange seems impossible in this oh so subtle topography but the earth reaching skyward is unmistakable we just make it to the top by sunset gasp at the view before it dissolves into darkness there's another fox scat on the exploration track we camp in helena and aurora's wide red rocked embrace long stripy ironstone arms stretched out around us the next day we run into the senior geologist of the company that wants to mine he is a good man he has found our lost spare tire and returns it to us offers us lunch and ice from the exploration camp kitchen tells us they'll never get approval to mine here but in the meantime it's a job I try to imagine what it would look like being mined. Reach line, gone, replaced by pit. And the woodland adjacent would be flattened to build the overburden dump that would instead touch the sky. Funny how the substrate of an endangered plant becomes a burden. There would be haul roads and crushes, rom pads and bores, a village to house the workers, an airstrip to fly them in. There would be offices, sewerage, generators, workshops, hydrocarbons, light, noise, dust. And the surrounding landscape would be riddled with roads and tracks. Part of the range might remain, of course, though not unscathed. I try to imagine it. In this quiet, it's a little hard, but the lights from the mine on the next range over remind me that odder things are true. We visit an abandoned mine. That is to say, it had been rehabilitated, which means that they piled up rocks around the edge of the pit, a bond to stop people falling in by accident before they called it a day. My science tells me that when it comes to understanding the impacts of a development on a place, we just don't know how little we know. So many impacts are cumulative, cryptic, enigmatic, and mostly what we don't know is huge. What we forget when we count our mineral revenues, the jobs created, our GDP, is the price that we pay. But I don't need my science to tell me that while we've loved iron since the Iron Age and gold since long before, mining is not the only thing that nourishes our lives. And the balance is fast to strike. And when the price is too high, it's too high. And it's us who decide at the end of the day, if to keep the old ironstone or to pocket the pay. And it's hard when it's far and remote and unknown, and every long-ranging impact is yet to be scientifically shown. And for now, we're stuck on the economic imperative ride. But still, consciously or not, it's us who decide. Thank you very much. So, I'm there, and I welcome the ball point.